My name is Stanley Sword and I have the great pleasure to welcome Nielena Carrasos from Philadelphia. You're one of the 100 best defense lawyers in the US and you have 22 awards until now. And, and uh, tell us if you were to, you know, need a lawyer yourself, what would be your best piece of advice for people in order to, to have the best possible defense if they have the unfortunate luck to, to need it? Hi, Daniel. It's my pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to um, to talk to you. If I needed a lawyer, I um, or for anyone who needs a lawyer, I, I personally, I think the most important thing, aside from obviously the person's qualifications and accolades and, and all of that, is you want a, a human being. You want a real person who is going to care about you who is going to prioritize you, who's going to know you as a person, who is going to know when your birthday is and send you a birthday card. I mean, you don't want to be one of a zillion clients that somebody, you know, has and doesn't have time for. You want to be um, important. You want to feel like the lawyer is invested in you, cares about what happens to you, and is going to do everything humanly possible to help you. Mm. Um, it, it may not work. I mean, you know, the reality is we can't control the universe. Some things are up to God. So, you know, and I tell clients that we can only take it so far after that pray. Mm. Okay. But at least I know that I've done everything humanly possible to help you. And I think that's really important for people who are facing the loss of their their lives you know their liberty their careers their families just everything disintegrating in front of them um when the federal government is knocking on their door they want to be able to sit back and say you know what we did i know that my lawyer did everything humanly possible and beyond to to help me mm. i think that's the most important thing and can you you obviously can have your own style as an as a lawyer how do we see it's you in the courtroom what's how your... do you see it's me yeah what's your unique style as a lawyer and and when you go to federal court well i'll be wearing red in <laughs> yeah. some form first of all because that is my favorite color so you'll see my red glasses you might see a red blouse a red suit jacket something red um my style is the way you see me now you know this is how i talk to to juries I am very open. I am very honest. I don't play games. Um, you know, many of my colleagues have a tendency to disregard evidence that they don't feel is favorable. They act like it just doesn't exist. I have never found that to be helpful because judges and juries see past that, you know. So I try to embrace whatever the evidence is and then try to provide an alternate, reasonable explanation as to whatever it is I'm trying to advocate for my client. So I talk to people, be it the judge, the jury, the prosecutor. I am never disrespectful. I, um, you know, I try to find as much common ground as I can, because uh, I think that's important, because then the bridge is less to get to where I want to be. And then I keep it real. I keep it. Uh, I keep it honest. And um, I also show people that I am very connected with my client. I care about the person. I know the person is a human being. And I invite the judge and the jury and the prosecutor mm -hmm. to see that person through my eyes. Mm -hmm. And I think that that makes a difference because seeing the person through my eyes is a very emotional experience and the days can be long in court do you feel flow sometimes or, or adrenaline or what's what kind of emotions do you go through during a day adrenaline you know when that adrenaline kicks in yes you know it just launches you thankfully because you're right they can be very long and very um very exhausting mm. um for me it's you know, I really feel like I have someone's life in my hands. And um, I also feel humbled by that, meaning I also recognize that it's, 
you know, there is a, a being, you know, higher than me, more powerful. So I do two things before I walk into court. First, I pray. I always pray. And I always listen to the theme song from Rocky. <laughs> That's a great start. <laughs> That's right. Those are the two starts to, you know, going into court. Yeah. Um, and so I think those things put me in the headspace that I need to be. You know, um, I ask for help from above and I'm raring to go. Um, Fantastic. It's uh, yeah. it's uh, and and then um, tell us about the courtroom. It's your parents from Greece. You spent your first six months in Greece, even though you're born in America, and uh, you have your heart there. You've been three months in the summer for for decades on end, and and yeah. the 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 courts in Greece and in Europe are different mm -hmm. to the courts in America. Tell us about they the are. differences between the, the the two continents and perhaps other parts of the world. Um, so, uh, yes, they're very different. My mom um, is also an attorney. She uh, went to law school in Greece, practiced in Greece before she came to the United States. Um, there it is very different. Greece, um, the legal system there is analogous to the legal system in France. Um, you have, um, it's called arios pagos in Greek, where um, it's a panel of judges that sit and hear you. Um, the standard of proof is very different. There you are presumed guilty and you have to prove your innocence. Here you are presumed innocent and the government has to prove you guilty, although there are many people that believe that it doesn't really work out that way. Um, and depending on the circumstances, um, it doesn't, but at least theoretically it, sh it should. Um, so it's a it's a very different system, um, which is why you know my mom couldn't practice here. Here we follow the Anglo-Saxon system, mm, like in Britain. Yes, exactly. And that's more based on on court cases than on the law book. It's more based on the on the jury system and also on the burden of proof. Um, the burden of proof in a criminal case here is beyond a reasonable doubt. That is a very high standard. It's much higher than in a civil case. In a civil case, it's basically a preponderance of the evidence. So it's just whatever tips the scale just a tiny bit, that's enough in a civil case. In a criminal case, it's not. It's, um, it's a very heavy weight on the scale, which um, presumably is supposed to favor defendants. Mm. And if you go to, because you work both with the violent crime and with white collar uh, crime. And if you go to, to jail in America for white collar crime, you can look, f you know, you can dread a much longer prison sentence than in Europe, for example. It's uh, a few years, but in America it can be a few hundred years, it seems. It, it can. So um, that has evolved in the United States. So... And this is one of the things I, I teach about when I go back and uh, lecture at Wharton, which is my alma mater. Um, I've been invited back many times to lecture on white collar crime, and, and I talk to them about the evolution. So when I was at Wharton, which was in the late 80s, um, it was, you know, it was viewed by the business schools very, very differently. And we we were not taught the same kind of ethics that um, law students are taught now um, or in recent years. Um, none of the business schools did. And, and I, I see that in colleagues, Wharton colleagues or other business school colleagues that I have represented. You know, it was never, there was a gray area. It was never clear where the line is. Mm. Uh, and it's often still not clear where the line is, but at least now we know there is a line, whereas the philosophy then was very different. You know, if you <clears throat> you, you wanted to be successful in, in business and there wasn't a, um, a discussion even on, on ethics. White collar crime by the federal courts or by any courts um, was not viewed seriously it was kind of poo-pooed if you will um until 
basically Enron, um, you know, until that kind of enormous debacle occurred and so many people lost everything they had, um, you know, and then at that point, the federal courts said, wait just a minute here. This is very serious. This is maybe much more serious than the white collar, than the violent crime and the drug cases, because we have to look at the people, you know, allegedly committing these crimes. <clears throat> Who are they and how did they get here? You know, for violent crimes and drug crimes, you'll see in large part, not exclusively, but in large part, you will see disadvantaged individuals. Mm. You'll see minorities. You'll see people who were, you know, came from broken families, uh, poverty. They didn't have role models. They, they sometimes didn't even have any adult at home, single parent homes, weren't able to go and get an education, were never shown the right way, if you will. Not that it's an excuse for a violent crime or drug crimes, but it is an explanation. <clears throat> so federal judges started to say, well, you know, I see the explanation and I'm willing to give this person a benefit of the doubt or, or at least a second chance or some sort of leniency. But in looking at white color defendants where not all, but most of them are well-educated, they come from good homes, um, they've had the advantages, they've never wanted for anything, <clears throat> excuse me, suffered for anything. So judges say, well, what is your excuse? You know, how did you get here? Mm. Um, and the law changed, and, and so they're viewed much more harshly, which actually in turn makes it, I think, much more important the way that I practice, which is um, a very holistic approach in, in understanding that when, when someone gets to my doorstep for a white collar crime, you know, many things have disintegrated in their lives. And so I try to look past the obvious, which is the case, and explore everything that has happened in the person's life to get that person to this point. And not always, but I'd say 98% of the time, there are very important psychological, medical, uh, mental health, whatever kind of issues and reasons um, that when put together and explored and developed in a scientific way can be very powerful in showing a judge who would otherwise say, and what is your excuse for being in my courtroom, at least showing a judge that it's not an excuse for the crime, but it is an explanation and perhaps warrants some leniency. And um, when when explored and developed, you know, in that way, um, judges, I think I've seen be very receptive, mm. you know, mm. to that. <clears throat> and a lot of times, perhaps it the, the original sin wasn't, you know, they, they they didn't plan to do crime, but one thing leads to another, like Bering's bank. They 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 right. sank a whole bank, but it wasn't for own profit in the beginning. But then to cover up a small sin, the sin gets like a snowball. Well, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And it's really important for um, you know for clients who find themselves in that position to to own what they did and to admit to themselves what they did. And that is actually a very pronounced problem that I have encountered um, for many years and continue to encounter with white collar defendants. You know, they, many of them, uh, if not most, not all, but many if not most, can't accept that they committed a crime because they weren't raised that way because they haven't lived a life of crime you know it's it's one thing led to another and then like you said you know they fell down the rabbit hole or they tried to cover up to make it not look as bad which is actually the worst thing that you can do but you know when they get caught in that in that cycle um they you know they don't realize it but they don't see themselves as criminals um, and it's very difficult to try to break through to someone like that and, and explain to them that, you know, 
it doesn't mean you're a bad person and it doesn't mean that there aren't great things about you, but you have to acknowledge that in this instance, you did something wrong because until and unless you see that we can't move past that in order to figure out how to, you know, how to help you. Mm. Um, and some of them are in such deep denial, um, <clears throat> you know, that they can't, they can't get, get past that. Mm. Um, for example, uh, the most pronounced example is, is a woman who I represented who was a God-fearing Christian woman who was also a businesswoman. And her marriage was falling apart, um, you know, for various reasons. And there was someone else out there who was really a player and who saw that and who took advantage of that in a romantic way um, in order to then uh, use her, get, you know, get her to go along with helping him in the criminal activity he wanted to do because of the license that she had, et cetera, in her professional field. So, but because she was such a, a Christian, you know, person, she could not get past what she had done. She couldn't accept that. And I had to break her down literally, which took months. And she was a very strong woman like me. And, and we were just like this. And, <laughs> and, and, and finally I told her, you know, look, we're wasting all our energy fighting each other where, you know, if we put it together, we could really be a very powerful force moving forward and trying to help you. And the longer you take to get there, the worse it's going to be. Mm. Um, it, it is a very pronounced problem unique to white collar defendants that I think um, as a lawyer, it's really important to see that. Mm. And, and looking forward, how do you see, uh, you know, the, 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 how to apply the laws in America for the coming decade or, or 25 years from now? Will, will it, Biden, for example, is talking about changing not so many drug crimes should lead to sentences and, and stuff. How do you see the future of law in America? Well, um, so I think it's important to first explain to you kind of how it's changed in the past four years. Um, you know, during the Trump administration, the emphasis, um, there was a clear directive from that administration to main justice not to focus on developing the big white collar cases. I mean, they would develop whatever, you know, obviously came to them, but they they were not focusing their energy and resources the same way in, um, uh, in uncovering and um, exploring the big white collar cases because that was the directive, you know, that had been given. They were told to focus more on violence and um, drugs and, and those kind of cases. So it really um, deteriorated in, in, a, in a great sense, um, the serious practice of, of white collar crime. Um, now I believe, um, we have yet to see, we're only two days into the new administration, but, you know, I, I believe there will be a shift, um, toward exploring those white collar, uh, criminal cases, uh, again, <clears throat> you know, and, and, and maybe viewing a little more differently the drug situation, uh, by recognizing that, you know, a lot of these people can be best helped through rehabilitation. Just putting them in prison doesn't really solve the problem. If they still have the underlying addiction, um, you know, you're really not, you're like that gerbil on the wheel who isn't going anywhere in trying to, to help them. Mm. Um, and on average, your cases, how much leads to, you know, sentences and how, how, how many percent is set free? Uh, and, and how do you feel after a loss or, or, you know, sometimes I guess it can be a sentence, but if it's a quite small sentence, it's still a win for you. It is. And actually the greatest win for me is the people who come to me very early on before they are charged with anything uh, or indicted, um, who recognize that I am in trouble. Even before they made a crime? <laughs> 
even, well, not before they made a, well, <laughs> I've never had anyone come to me before they, you know, not did so something far. wrong, but before they're found out or before the case has developed or early enough so that I can try to turn things around for them and prevent any charges. You know, the most successful cases, in my opinion, are those who that never see a courtroom, mm. those who I'm able to keep out either by convincing the government not to charge them or getting them immunity or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, that, I think, is critical. And I think it's also critical, you know, for people, for anyone out there who may listen to this and and um, to realize that the, the most valuable time is early in the beginning, you know, kind of like when you have uh, an illness, you know, the, the greatest chance you have is in the very beginning. Once it begins to progress to a later stage and metastasize or whatever the case may be, it's a lot harder, you know, and the same is, is true uh, in my world. Mm. The same is true in my world. So, so I think you're right. I, I mean, I try to keep it very real with the clients from, from the beginning. You know, I'm not one of those lawyers who tells them, oh, don't worry, um, you know, you'll get out of this and don't worry about anything if I don't believe that. You know, I don't want someone to hire me with false expectations. It's important to have reasonable expectations. And depending upon the circumstances and the evidence, the most reasonable expectation in a particular case may be to try to mitigate the sentence as much as possible, which in and of itself is like a trial. I mean, it is just as difficult and time consuming uh, to, to advocate um, in federal court for a, a sentence as it is to just take somebody to to trial, if you mm. will. Mm. And when you go up against the the, the federal, <clears throat> for example, FBI, uh, it's you have a lot of persons on the other side, you're quite lonely on your side. How is that power struggle? It it seems to be a little uneven yeah. sometimes. Yes, I mean, you're you're right. I mean, they have um, you know the the power of the federal government behind them. Um, and so it's um, there's an inequity there. Obviously, there's an there's an imbalance, and that's always going to you know going to exist. But um, I I really don't I it, I don't sit around and think about it. You know, I, I don't think about the things we don't have. Um, I think about the things we can do. Um, <clears throat> and from the very beginning of a case, I tell my client, you know, look, I'm going to spend as much time with you as possible, getting to know you, every aspect of your life, because there may be something that you don't realize that will actually turn out to be very important in helping me, you know, build that bridge to from where we are to where we want to be. And I tell them, you know, think of yourself as a squirrel, you know, collect every acorn that you can for the winter. Doesn't matter if you like it, just collect it for me and I'll decide because those acorns will then serve to build that bridge. Because once I understand, you know, what a person is like as a human being and what, you know, all has happened, then I can try to figure out the way from a legal, from a medical, from a scientific, from whatever perspective to get us to where we need to be, mm. which hopefully <clears throat> with your freedom, either outright or, as soon as possible. Mm. And does it ever happen that you, you know, you, you feel someone is guilty and you help them to, to be free and there is some guilt in your life later on? Is, is there a... Uh, when I understand you, what you're asking. And, and they um, perhaps commit another crime and, and if you hadn't been able to, you know, set them free, they would have... How is that relationship within you? Um, I do not. Yes, um, I I do not feel guilty if I am able to successfully represent someone who has committed a crime. <clears throat> and the reason that I don't feel guilty is because it is not about that. You know, this is not a moral. I mean, there is a moral question, but that is between the client 
and his or her maker, whoever that may be. It is not in the legal system. The legal system is about one thing. It is about whether the federal government can prove someone's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. That's it. It's not about whether you really are. And I tell, and I'm very honest with juries. You know, I tell them that. I tell them, you may think, you may feel in your heart that my client is guilty. Doesn't matter. My client may be guilty. It doesn't matter. Okay. This is not a, you know, moral forum. This is a legal forum. The only question that you have is whether the government has proven that guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. And that is the way that we collectively, me as a defense attorney, you as jury, you know, a jury, the judge, everybody holds the federal government accountable and in some sort of check mm. so that the federal government can't run rampant over everybody's rights. You know, if the federal government cannot prove a case, then that is what it what it is. And maybe, you know, next time they'll be able to if there is a next time. I mean, on a personal level, <clears throat> I try to prevent that. I, you know, aside from what happens in court, I try to tell my clients, look, I, you know, I want you as my friend going forward. I don't want you as a repeat client. Let's talk about why, you know, you got yourself into this situation and why you were lucky to get out of it. But we want to try to help you repair what has gone wrong so that you can go forward in a good way and not be, you know, back doing the same things, whatever they may be. And what would be your three best pieces of advice for the next generation who want to become lawyers in the U.S.? Um, I think it would be one piece of advice, just one. Don't do it because you think it's a great profession, because your parents want you to be lawyers, because you want the title of Esquire, because you think you're going to make a lot of money, because, 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 you know, we have too many lawyers as it is and many not good ones. So don't do it for any of those reasons. Do it if you have a calling. Do it if it matters to you, if it you know, makes a difference in your life. If you think you can make a difference in someone else's life, do it because you believe in it. Um, do it because you have a passion for, you know, for helping people, particularly in, in my world, mm -hmm. everything else will come, you know, those are not good reasons. You know, you should never define yourself And I tell, um, you know, um, Wharton students that as well when I when I go back to, to speak with them. Same thing as I, you know, would tell young lawyers, you know, or young prospective lawyers starting out, you know, define yourself in some way other than money. Define yourself through integrity. Define yourself in something you believe in, because that will help you to see the line, because there are you know, look, the, the problems that my clients have, many lawyers have as well, you know, they um, don't see that line clearly, and they end up getting into trouble themselves. So I think it's important to define yourself through uh, something other than money, through integrity, practice that way, do the right thing, you know, always do the right thing, because integrity is what happens when no one is watching. You know, you know what you've done. You know how you are. You know if you're doing things the right way and if you're helping people and the rest will will fall into place. Mm. Um, and if it's not about that for you, find another profession. Mm. And if you were to become a philosopher and write a chapter about being a lawyer, what would be the very essence, you think, of being a lawyer? You know, my um, one of my former mentors, um, Emmett Fitzpatrick, who was my former law partner, um, it, you know, um, some people would make fun of him and they would call him um, a priest in lawyer's clothes. <laughs> um, and I think that's the the essence. The essence is, you know, there has to be a higher calling or there, sh there doesn't have to be, but there should be. I, you know, I, I think in order to make a real difference in this world, there has to be a higher calling. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, if you were to take the 100 best lawyers in America and, and, and take them to the psychologist and try to find you know, the common threads between you, uh, what would be that, the connections that you all share? I'd like to think that um, the connections would be that we are very driven to succeed, <clears throat> very driven to do our best, um, and that we hopefully care um, about helping people and, and making a difference. I think, you know, I've seen so many people, so many colleagues, um, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> I have allergies. Um, I've seen so many colleagues get out of the legal profession because they burn out and they don't, they don't want to do it anymore because they never went into it for the right reason. So I think those who are successful hopefully have gone into it for, you know, for the right reason and um, <clears throat> believe that they're really making a difference in this world. But we are a very driven, uh, you know, bunch. I think we're very driven, not necessarily competitive against other people, but within ourselves, you know, we want to, to do the best, to be the best, to help someone as much as possible. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, what's the most traumatic you experienced so far in, in your career, in, in the courtroom or outside of it as a lawyer? The most traumatic? Yeah. <clears throat> the most traumatic was um, probably one of uh, probably the, the first very most serious case that I had when I started in private practice. Um, it was uh, really a boy. I mean, he was of adult age, but he was very, very young. And he was um, charged with murder, first degree murder, and, and they were seeking the death penalty against him. <clears throat> he had been um, a client of Emmett Fitzpatrick's when I joined him in his firm. But this young man um, had a connection to me and wanted me to be the one to represent him. So I pretty much took over, took over the case. And it was a horrific uh, crime. It was a horrific crime. Uh, he and the co-defendant had stalked someone, uh, had robbed the person, and ended up killing the person. And, um, you know, from the very beginning when I saw this young man, I... As crazy as this may sound, he had kind eyes. I saw kindness in his eyes. And I saw a young man who had, um, he came from a good family, you know, wonderful parents. His father's, uh, his brother was a police officer. Um, and he just got, his mother had been in an accident and fell into a coma. And he got caught up with a bad group and just went very far astray. And I wanted to save his life. That was my goal. And he was so guilt-ridden that he kept leading the investigation to evidence that was pointing to his guilt. It was like Raskolnikov in Crime and Punishment. It was like he needed to be punished, and I was trying to save him. So, or save him from being executed, at least. And it was this, you know, uh, push and pull. I... I felt the weight of the world on my shoulders. I was very, very young. Um, I was walking the streets of Philadelphia, praying to God for something to happen for me to be able to help this young man. And then mana from heaven came down, evidence that I was able to use in order to help him, in order to save his life. And um, thank God I did. And he then um, was so appreciative and he, you know, kept thanking me. And I told him, look, if you really want to thank me, you'll make something of your life. You know, you'll learn to read. He had dropped out of school. Learn to read, you know, better yourself, make a difference, you know. And he told me he would make me proud. And he did. He, he then spent the next, you know, it's been 20 years now, <clears throat> changing his life and making me proud. And that was the most traumatic experience for me because he was on the verge of being executed, but it was also one of the most rewarding. Mm. Amazing. And, and, and can you tell us about the history of lawyers in America from the Wild West? People were settling their own disputes 
uh, and and then you have federal <clears throat> courts now. It's it's a long journey in a short time span. It is. <clears throat> it's a very long journey. Um, <clears throat> I think that um, one of the uh, most influential lawyers. Uh, was probably the best president we've ever had, at least in historic times, in my humble opinion, who was Abraham Lincoln. And he never went to law school. At that time, you didn't have to go to law school to be a lawyer. You did an apprenticeship. Um, but he, you know, the reason that I think he was both uh, the best lawyer and the best president was because he had a guiding light inside of him. <clears throat> He knew, you know, the difference between right and wrong. He had a calling. He wanted to make a difference. Um, ultimately, he lost his life as a result, but he did make a difference. And I think it's the same way, you know, with lawyers and, and hopefully that evolution. Mm. Nielena, warm thank you and uh, the best of luck on your journey. We thank you so much. Well, thank, um, you. thank you so much. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate having had this opportunity to um, share this with you and hopefully with someone, you know, the next me out there, if you will, the next young person who will make a difference in this world, because I know they're out there.